right, take your Bibles and turn with me to <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 16 is going to be where we're going to be this morning. Um, just uh, up front, um, we're going to read this passage, but we're not going to look at it in depth this morning because of <clears throat> just other things to be said as we prepare for this little series that we're going to do on giving. Um, you know, the privilege um, that we have as the church to give God uh, what he has bestowed to us in salvation really is uh, an understatement when we think about all that God has given to us and trying to repay God in a sense is not the motive for giving, but it's out of the thankful heart that we give and we, you know, we talk about giving, we think about giving of our time, giving of what we possess, like our home, our possessions, those kinds of things. But this, this series is not really going to be on those items. Uh, the message we, talked, we, we had over the past few weeks when it talked about building mature churches <coughs> was the message is geared to service, right? If you want to think about your life and giving God what is yours, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, is that application of your service in the sense of using your spiritual gifts. Uh, but this series is about money. This series is about us as Christians giving our money uh, as an act of worship and to give it to the church. You know, the biblical principles of giving is one of the most, probably most misunderstood, most misused topics probably within the church. And to help us as a church to be informed to these biblical issues, these biblical precedents, I want us to think about those today and over the next few weeks. I would like us to take a brief journey uh, over the next few weeks, just exploring what the Bible says, what the Bible teaches as it relates to giving and the believer's responsibility in that. Obviously, this series is not going to be able to go in depth and talk and touch about every aspect of what the Bible teaches, but we're going to uh, cover some really good ground, I think, that's going to help us as a church really wrap our minds around what our responsibility is. You know, in the church, when you think about us corporately, uh, there are certain practices that are directly rooted to the fundamentals of our faith. And if I you, we probably could all really go, you know, know what those are. Those two practices would be what? Baptism and the Lord's table. And a lot of times as a church, you know, we don't really know. We know we do those things. We know those are a regular part of our body life. We, we see them on regular occasions. But how many of us really know what they're rooted in? And most of us do understand that these two ordinances play a very critical part in the function of our local church. We understand their origins. We kind of understand why we do them. The act of, for example, the act of public baptism is how the church sees and hears uh, that someone isn't born again, that someone is a believer. They're following Christ. They're standing up giving public profession. This idea of coming before the church and saying, you know, I love Jesus and I put my faith in him and I'm following him. And now I want to obey him in this public demonstration of uniting myself in Christ through baptism. We understand that. We see that. We know why we do that. Then we have the Lord's table. The Lord's table is something that we participate in, you know, on a regular basis. And that is to remind us of what Christ has done for us in the gospel. It is a picture of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, the benefits that we have in all of that is memorialized, right, through the Lord's table, through taking the bread and the juice. It doesn't save us, but it's a picture. It's a symbol. It's something that we do to remember, to take a moment in our Christian experience to look at what Christ has accomplished. We don't take the bread and we don't take the juice and we're not infused with grace in that moment. It's none of that. It's just a memorial of what Christ did for us. These precious and glorious acts within the local church play a critical part in our body life. They're a very critical part of who we are as the church. And I want to be better at taking time to talk about those things, right? To preach on baptism, to preach on the Lord's table, to help remind us why these are so important. 
Well, one aspect of body life that we're going to be addressing over the next few weeks that we don't really think about as body life is that is giving. We, we do this every week, right? We just did it. <laughs> we passed the plate, right? We passed the plate. We dropped some, kind of, some type of monetary gift into the basket, and then we move on to the next part of the worship service, right? We move on to prayer. We move on to the preaching of God's word. We move on to more music, whatever the order might be. But we do this every week, week after week. We give. We drop something in the plate. And a lot of times, we don't ever think about it after that, do we? We know we're supposed to. We do it. And then we just don't think about it anymore. We just do our responsibility. Well, the concern in all three of these areas, baptisms, the Lord's table, and giving, we have a very limited theological understanding of those three things. And I believe that giving is probably one of the most deficient areas in our Christian experience that, where that knowledge is lacking. Because if we did a poll this morning and I said, why do you give? We're going to get like 100 different answers. And there's not 100 people in here, but we would get close to that, right? Uh, you might say, well, I give because I'm supposed to. I give because I'm supposed to tithe. And, you know, and then we could talk about is tithing for the New Testament, is tithing for this period. So there's all these kind of different ideas when you think about giving, right? Well, I got to give 10%. Well, you know, I don't, I, I, you know, what should I give? How should I give? When should I give? All these questions come up when you think about that. But do we really give time to really consider the privilege we have in giving. You see, you know, Jesus in Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20, says something very important. And we know this. He says that we're to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded, right? I mean, that is what the church is to be about. That's what we as Christians are to be about. So in the process of making a disciple, we are called to teach believers to obey all that Jesus has commanded. And this would include the matter of giving. This includes that. So as your pastor this morning, it falls to me as your principal teacher in this church to teach you what the Bible says about giving. And the responsibility then lays on your heart and with your God to be obedient to him. Because with knowledge comes what? Responsibility. When you're informed to the biblical standard, when you're informed to what is true, then there is responsibility. So if you don't want to hear this, you need to leave today. <laughs> RJ, you have to sit down. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so with this truth, you have to recognize that I'm dispensing to you what the Bible teaches, right? I'm giving to you what God's word says, and therefore we are responsible with all truth to be obedient to that truth. We can't shuck and jive it. We can't say, I don't like that, or I'm, you know, I'm going to do what I've always done. So this is inevitably going to, at some point in this series on giving, either going to be a super encouragement to you or something that's super convicting, right? It's just inevitable. And that's a good thing. We want the Holy Spirit to do that. So as your pastor, I want you to consider that I'm doing this out of my responsibility uh, to love and shepherd you through, to do and, and be faithful to what Christ has commanded. So this, so this issue is not a sensitive subject at all, right? It's not a taboo. It's not something that I go, well, just because I benefit from the giving here because I'm the pastor that I shouldn't talk about it. No, that's not the right perspective at all. It's not a sensitive subject. It's not a taboo subject. It is a biblical subject that we all have to follow, that we all are called to. So this, this talk of money, which a lot of times it's, you know, oh my goodness, we're going to talk about money, because the church has misunderstood it for so long. There's been so much bad representation of what the Bible teaches. There's been such abuses with it that there needs to be a clear call for what the Bible really says what the Bible really teaches as it relates to this wonderful topic. So in order to help us with this subject, help us to understand what God wants, I want us to take our time over this course of, you know, the next few weeks. I want Paul, in the letter of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 to 4, 
to kind of be the launching point for this. So take your Bibles and turn there. We're going to read this passage together because this is what's going to inform what we're going to say. This is going to inform where we're going. This is going to help shape uh, what the Bible teaches on this most wonderful topic. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 16 in verse 1 writes this. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, Each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry out your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. Now, here in 1 Corinthians... We have Paul giving this church some very specific instructions, right? I mean, it's very specific in these first four verses. The rest of the letter, I mean, the rest of 1 Corinthians has been very instructive on correcting things that they've done wrong. But here, in verse 16, he's giving them some specific instructions on how to conduct themselves as it relates to this collection that Paul is gathering up. Many commentators, or preachers I should say, have divided this particular passage up in outlining five truths or six truths. So I'm going to give you those this morning as just so that you can sort of know where we're going over the course of time. One preacher outlined verses 1 through 4 with these headings. You can write these down if you'd like, um, as, and we're going to get to these. It's the purpose in giving. This is what this passage teaches. The purpose in giving. Then he says the principle in giving, the participants in giving, the place in giving, the proportion in giving, and the protection in giving. Those are six truths pulled out of these four verses that one pastor that I looked at was used. And they're, they're here. They're right here in this text. You don't have to have a seminary degree to figure this out, right? But another guy gave five points, which I like, and I think this is the one we're going to use over the next few weeks. The first one he gives, the giving was church-centered. The giving was regular. The giving was for everyone. The giving was proportionate. And the giving was carefully handled. So no matter what outline we're going to use over the next few weeks, these truths will be things we are going to discover. We're going to learn We're going to grow, we're going to mature, and we're going to be obedient to what God calls us to do here in this passage. But before we get into this text, there are some preliminary things I want us to consider today as we think about the responsibility or the privilege we have as believers when it comes to this subject of giving. The first thing I want us to consider this morning is what Jesus said about giving. And I want you to do that with me. By looking at Matthew chapter 6 for just a moment. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about the heart. And this is what we really want to think about as we begin the series, is the heart behind it. And I want you to notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth And rust, destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy. And where thieves do not break in and steal. From where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Jesus here is really encouraging us not to be consumed with the world's riches. And he does that by reminding us of the transitory nature of the things that you might hold dear. Right? He's saying we should not be so worldly minded that we're storing up all these treasures on this earth that are going to vanish. When's the last time, you know, we all know this little saying, when's the last time you saw a Hirsch pulling a U-Haul? You never see that, right? The things you possess today, once you're dead and gone, will go to someone else. 
So where is our heart in giving? Is Jesus is telling us, is it all wrapped up in this world? And he's telling us your heart is what will dictate that, right? Your heart will dictate how you spend your money, how you spend your time, where you put all of your efforts will dictate where your heart is. And that's what Jesus is saying. This has far-reaching ramifications outside of just the pocketbook, right? But here it is. You look at your pocketbook, it determines what you really care about, right? If you look at where you spend your money, like it, you look at where you spend your time, determines a lot of where your heart really is. And that's what Jesus is teaching here in this passage. He says, where your treasure is, what? There is where your heart is as well. Listen, Jesus is not condemning wealth here. He's not condemning riches or money. Because having money is a great asset, right? Because it provides for your family's needs. That's why you work. That's why you save. That's why you give, is to do what? To provide for your family. Wealth can be used to help meet the needs of someone else. It's not a sin to earn money. It's not a sin to be rich. It's not a sin to earn a lot of money. But it's what you do with that money is what matters, is what Jesus is saying. It can be used to help others, and it should be used to the furtherance of the gospel. So when Jesus is talking about wealth and riches and storing things up, he's not bemoaning the fact that that's evil. He's talking about your heart. Where is your heart in all that? See, money can be a snare, can't it? And that's what Jesus is talking about as well. It can be a snare for those that do not have money, which probably would be the majority of us in this room. We don't have a lot of money, because, and therefore, what are we doing? We're always thinking about, where can I get more money? It can be a snare. How can I make more money? Where, you know, where's my bread going to come from from tomorrow? We can be hindered by lack of it. You can be hindered. It can be a snare for you if you have tons of it, because it becomes the aim of your life, becomes the motivation of your life. And this is what Jesus is saying. Where's your heart? What do you desire? You see, Jesus is warning us of the pursuit of riches as the goal of one's life. If your aim in life is earthly pursuits, then there is where your heart will be. And he's warning against that. You see, our giving to God is the greatest test of where we place our ultimate treasures. And this is what Jesus is teaching us. Thomas Watson said this, he used the wonderful analogy to help us with this, talking about a boat and water. Listen to what he says. Water is useful to the ship, and it helps it to sail better into the harbor. But let water get into the ship. If it is not pumped out, it drowns the ship. So riches are useful and convenient for our passage through life. We sail more comfortably with them through the troubles of this world. But if the water gets into the ship, if love of riches gets into the heart, then we become drowned by them. So that's the first thing I want us to consider this morning is where is our heart? Is our heart wrapped up in riches or is our heart wrapped up in things eternal? Second thing I want us to consider this morning is the fact that the act of giving is an act of worship. A lot of times we don't consider when you write a check or when you pull out money from your wallet and you, or you go on PayPal and, and you pay through PayPal, whatever your means of giving money to the church, guess what? It is an act of worship. A lot of times we, we define worship as just the music, right? We define worship in the church as singing hymns and raising our hands and clapping or whatever you might do. We hardly ever define worship as preaching. We hardly ever define worship as fellowship. We hardly ever define the word worship as those things. We only categorize it to one aspect of life, what we do on Sunday. Worship is all of life. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, you do what? For the glory of God. That's what we're called to do. Everything is worship. Even giving is worship. We are to give as an act of worship. Now, the act of 
giving as pictured even in the now think of this this may be a shocker to you even in the old testament was an act of free will giving to god that was based in worship a lot of times when you think about giving in the both both testaments we think about well the old testament's all about tithing right and you got to give all this money to god and then the new testament you turn the page and it's all about what Grace giving, there's no more tithing, right? But all grace giving has been established even in the Old Testament as an act of worship. And I want to show you a few things this morning as we prepare our hearts for this. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 8 for just a moment. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 20 is a familiar text. We know this saying very well. It is the flood account, Genesis 6 through 8, uh, and chapter 9. We know that here uh, Noah goes into the ark, 40 days and 40 nights happens, and then finally the ark rests. And here in uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, we have Noah's response to God. Notice what it says. Then, and this is after the boat lands and the door opens all of these things happen and then noah built an altar to the lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar the lord smelled the smooth offering the lord said to himself i will never again curse the ground on the account of man for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth and i will never again destroy Every living thing as I have done. So in verse 20, we have a free will act of Noah. There is no law that Noah has to make an altar. There is no command that Noah is to do this. This is out of the abundance from his heart to freely give to God worship in the form of sacrifice. Now remember, this is not Mosaic law motivating Noah. This is a free act of his own heart to worship. Look at Genesis 14, another example. Genesis 14, verses 17 through 20 is the account of Abram and his encounter with the king of Salem, Melchizedek. And in his encounter with Melchizedek and them defeating all of these other kings, what we find in verse 18, it says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. And he is, this is very picturesque to the fact that this is the pre-incarnate Christ. No origins, nothing here. This is a picture of the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ in this passage. And here in verse 19 Abram says, he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. Now here we see Abram freely giving a tenth of everything he had. This is not commanded. This is not coerced. This is a free act on Abram's part. We're reminded here that there is a pattern being set up of the tenth. But what we see here is this is not a commanded offering. This is a free will offering by Abram. He's saying, I want to do this because of what this man has done for me and what this man has accomplished for me. I am going to give him a tenth of all. That's what the passage says, of all that he possesses. So this is an act of worship. It's a free will gift. It's an act of what he wants to give. There's another passage that speaks to this in Genesis 28. And this is where Jacob, after he is journeying, lays down in a certain spot and goes to sleep. When he fell asleep, he sees Jacob's ladder. And in all of this, God says, where you've laid your head, all of this land, all of these possessions will be yours. So Jacob here is discovering something wonderful. God has revealed to him what he had promised to Abraham. And because of this, in verse 22, 
Jacob says, this stone where he had laid his head, which I have set up as a pillar, will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. This is again a response to God as an act of worship. Giving here is seen as a free will gift. It is an act of worship. It's not coerced. It's not law. It's not you have to. It is I want to because of what God has done for me. Even in Deuteronomy, when we get later into the history of Israel, giving is an act of worship. It's not based just on law. Here we have gotten into the Mosaic Covenant and to the theocracy that's going to be developed through Israel. There will be a higher taxation, so to speak, on these people. So, but all of that is a response to God for what he's done for Israel. He saved them out of Egypt. Now he says, here's my law. Here's how you're to obey it. Now Moses is relaying all of this to the second generation. In verse 10, it says, When you cross the Jordan, so he's speaking to the people of Israel, and live in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies around you so that you will live in security, then it shall come about that the place in which the Lord your God will choose for his name to dwell, there you shall bring all, now listen to what he's saying, all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and your contributions of your hand and all your choice votive offerings which you will vow to the Lord. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God and your sons and your daughters and your male and your female servants and the Levites who is within your gates since he has no portion or inheritance with you. So this is a command by God to follow through with their giving because of what God has done for them. When you cross the land. Again, this is an act of worship. Giving is an act of worship. And we turn to the New Testament. That paradigm remains the same. Because when you get to passages like Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. It reminds us that salvation is by what? It's by grace. That none of us should boast. Now, in the New Testament era, one of the ways we worship God is through giving cheerfully, right? We give because of what God has given. And where do we find this? Well, we can see a glimpse of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, I want you just to listen to this. You can turn there. Because here we see the response of the believer and the gratitude that is in his, is, that is in his heart. In verse 7, he says, Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly nor under compulsion, for God loves a what? A chill forgiver. So Paul is really telling us here, we, we are to give from the heart, not grudgingly. What does it mean to give grudgingly? It's to look at your paycheck, Right? And go, wow, i got to give some of that to God? Lord, don't you know how much I make? That's grudgingly. God wants us to purpose in our heart what we are to give. And we are to give it freely. Right? We're to give it out of a cheerful heart. That's what worship is. Worship is responding to God based on His grace. And one way we worship him is to give freely to him what we've determined in our hearts. Now, the third thing I want to consider this morning as we think about this is giving to the local church. Yes, we need to think about our hearts when we give. We need to think about worship, our giving as an act of worship. But thirdly, I want us to consider this morning that our giving is to support the local church. That is the focus of the New Testament. Now, we're not talking about brick and mortar when we think about the church. We're not talking about at our new location when we think about giving to the local church. We're not talking about just that, right? We're talking about the body, the people that make up the body of Christ, you and I. 
And when we give, we are giving to support the local ministry of your local church. That's when you give, that's where all your money goes. It goes to do that very thing. So our giving goes to help our church be exactly what God has designed it to be. God has not called us to give our money to any institution in the world except to the church because this is, what, this is God's program. If you can show me other, any other program that God is using today other than the church, please do. But as I've studied the scripture, there is only one place we are to give first and primary, and that is the local church church because this is god's mission in this world this is god's primary way so when we give to the church we are giving to what god has established to build and he uses us he uses those gifts to help us win the lost and mature the saint now what are we going to see in our passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 16? I want you to just go there for a minute as we think about some of these things. Is Paul's attention to that very idea. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 1. In our text, the Apostle Paul is laser focused on local church giving. Do you see that? You see a collection of of three or more churches mentioned in this passage. When he says, now concerning the collection for the saints, that's church number one. Do you know who those saints are? It's the church at Jerusalem. That's church number one mentioned here. As I directed the churches of Galatia, that's church number two. And that's not one church, that is many churches in Galatia. So Paul is referring to not just their little church in Corinth, he's referring to the church in Jerusalem, he's referring to the churches in Galatia, and then he says, so do you also. He's pointing out the church at Corinth. The Apostle Paul is local church oriented. He's not parachurch oriented. He's not farming out the church's responsibility to other institutions except the body of Christ. And that's what he's teaching us here in this passage. So when we give, when we think about giving money, we need to funnel that money to the local church so the church can be the church in the world in which it is planted. This is what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking to a local church about giving to a local church. And that begs the question, why? Obviously, in the context, we're going to get into that next Sunday, but in a big picture thought, why is Paul so laser focused on giving to the local churches? Why is he so concerned about the health of the church in Jerusalem? Why is he so concerned that Galatia, all the churches in Galatia, however many they are, that they unify together, getting this collection together to help this church and the church at Corinth to do the same thing? Well, I think there are three things that we could consider. If we were going to think about that. And I think it's important. So the clear purpose of giving in the local church has really three basic overall reasons. And the first one is to support those in need. When the local church, when you give, and we go back to what I was saying in my opening statements, when you drop that money in the offering plate, here's where it's going to. So just think of it like that. First, it's going to support those in the local church who have what? Who have legitimate needs. Now, I know this might seem very elementary to us, but this is, but this is not always practiced, right? Now, in Acts, let's go, let's, let's sort of see this prescri let's see this described, descriptive, I guess you could say, in Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, verses 34 to 35, we have this picture painted very clearly for us. Now, verse 34, look at what he says in Acts 4. For there was no needy person among them. Wow, that's a great statement. There was no needy person in this context that had a need. 
Now, what we want to decide what is a need and what is a want, right? You may want cable, but guess what? That ain't a need. You may want Wi-Fi, but that may not be a need. You need electricity. You need food. So when we read this passage, what is it saying? That there was no needy person. That has to come to mean that their basic needs were met. Their basic needs were met. They had shelter. They had clothing. They had all they could ever need. Why? Because the church took it upon themselves to care for that body. Look at what the text says. For all who were owners of land or house would sell them and bring the proceeds of those sales and lay them at the apostles' feet and they would distribute to each as any had need. Grace Bible Church, this is a great passage to instruct us on how giving is to be done in the local church and how the needs of other people can be met. They shared life together, so much so they knew who needed something. In, you know, we got to think about this. This is the, 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 the um, church that was born at Pentecost. This is a brand new church, right? And there were people in this church. I mean, the text tells us that how many people were in the, new, the church at Pentecost at this particular time. There were about 3,000 people. Because you've got to remember, there was an influx of Jews that came into this region to celebrate Pentecost. And all of these churches were packed with foreigners, people who had come outside and gotten saved and stayed. And the people who were in Jerusalem already, who may have been wealthy or maybe not so wealthy, had possessions. What did they do to meet the needs of the people there? They sold their possessions and gave it to the church. And that's what you have to see here in verse 35. They laid that money... At the feet of the apostles. That's just another way of saying they gave that money so that the leadership of the church could do what? Decide where that money needed to be spent in caring for the needs of the body. Because who is the shepherds of the souls of those members of this church? It was the apostles. It wasn't just someone saying, hey, can you pay my light bill this month? Or, hey, you know, we need a little change over in our directions. No, it sounds like to me that the apostles had a vetting process in place to determine who would be cared for and who would not be cared for. Now, if you turn over to Acts chapter 6, just a few pages over, we know that there became some disputes among some people in the church Uh, namely the Hellenistic Jews speak against the native Hebrews because these widows were being overlooked and getting served food. So we see this influx of people, an influx of people that had great need, and the church wanted to meet those needs. And they did what was necessary. And one of the ways they did this was raising up deacons, right? So that those deacons could respond to those little fires that were popping up and put those out so the apostles could work at preaching and teaching the word of God. So this church, in God's timing, was taking care of what? Itself in love. This is what this body was doing. This was to help the believers in this church. It wasn't, don't hear me, don't hear the spirit of this wrongly, because what I'm going to tell you this morning is true, but it sounds maybe a little unloving. The church's responsibility is to care first and foremost for those in its four walls. Do you hear me? The church's responsibility is to care first and foremost for those who are here. That's our responsibility. We're not to care for folks who just walk off the street and want a free handout. The details reveal that that monies that were given here in this passage, the leadership determined where those monies would be spent. A good example of this, I think, is in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Look with me there in verse 8. Because here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, we have Paul writing to Timothy about how to order the church. Here's how the church is to be ordered. Here are the things you're to do. Here's how you are to establish the church. Here's how you're to interact among one another. And one of the issues was the needs of widows. Now you would think like, well, if they're a widow, let's just serve them, right? Let's give them money and let's give them food, let's give them shelter. But Paul didn't take that approach. Only true widows who met certain qualifications 
were the ones whose needs were met. It just wasn't willy-nilly, hey, I'm a widow, so here, I need a check, right? No, it was, no, they had to meet certain criteria. Now, let's look at this. Look at verse 8. He says, first and foremost, Paul says this, but if anyone does not provide for his own, speaking of his own family, and especially for those within his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. A widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, so there's an age qualification, having been the wife of one man, another qualification, having a reputation of good work, so there was some context with this particular woman, whether she was godly or not, whether she lived a life of godliness, and if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work, but refuse to put younger widows on the list, for when they feel sensual desires in disregard for Christ, of Christ, they want to get married, thus incurring condemnation, because they have set aside their previous pledge. Now, here is what Paul's teaching us here. Widows have to meet certain qualifications for the church, therefore, to give and care for them. This is a great point to make, because we live in a culture where people want something for what? For nothing. They want a handout. They want a freebie. They want all kinds of things. You would be shocked if I were to tell you how many phone calls I might get at a certain season of people calling and saying, hey, do y'all pay people's lights, lights bill? And I'm like, no, we do not do that. You need to call your power company. If you can't pay your bill, I ain't got, that's not my problem, right? Now, silver and gold, I have none. But Jesus Christ, who I do have, I will share him with you, <laughs> is my, repro uh, my, my approach to them. That is not unloving. That is biblical, church. That is biblical theology and practice. You do not want to give a $100 bill to somebody who's going to go buy a $100 ounces of whiskey you do not want to give somebody who's wasted their own money to take your hard-earned money and waste it as well we don't do that the church is a steward not only of the gospel but it's a steward of people and it's a steward of our own possessions this is what the bible teaches us this is what we see here in this passage but see, here's the blessing of it. What a blessing we can be to those in the church that are seeking to honor the Lord, right? What a blessing we can be to those who find themselves in trouble for whatever reason. We find some trouble in life, right? Car breaks down. Someone loses their job. Someone's diagnosed with a sickness and has a huge binnacle bill. We can't control those things. But what a blessing to be a part of a body that loves one another, cares for one another. And when that need is known, the elders and the body can come together and do what? Plan to meet those needs. What a great family to be a part of. That's what the New Testament teaches, is we are to care for ourselves. Now, we have made a mistake in the past. I will be honest with you this morning and not following this principle as we should have. We've helped people in the past because we have a big heart, but we didn't follow the vetting process. We helped put someone in a home. We helped buy them groceries one Christmas. We loved them as much as we could, but this individual was not a member of this church, and she ended up just using us for her own personal gain. She didn't love the Lord. She loved herself. And we will never do that again. So this is a wise point. So the church supports those who have need. Secondly, we give to the local church to support the church's pastors. That's the other reason we give every week. The New Testament teaches this as a principle. Now, since you're in 1 Timothy chapter 5, I want you to look at verse 17. 
In verse 17, Paul says the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the labor is worthy of his wages. So one of the reasons we give as believers in a local congregation is to support the full-time elder or pastor within that congregation. That is what the scripture teaches. That's what we are called to do. And this is what Paul is saying. So Paul, writing to Timothy, is doing something very critical here. He's ordering the church and how it should be ran. Right? That's what Paul, Timothy is where? He's at the church of Ephesus. They are bad men in, in, in positions. Chapter 1 says they're teaching bad doctrine. He says, you've got to get rid of those guys and raise up godly elders. And when you do that, here's how you're to order it. And he's giving an example of this in verse 17. And one example of caring for your church is caring for who? Your preaching pastors, your preaching elders. That's what he's saying here in this text. In the establishment of leadership in the church, the elders, Paul says here, that rule well, are to be considered of double honor. Now, in your, in your English Bibles, there's a little comma, and then there's a word, especially. Segregating another group of elders. You know, you, have you seen a Venn diagram? You know, you have this circle, and that circle represents, let's say, elders. But within that diagram, you have another circle within the circle that has elders that's how you need to view this so within the realm of elders there are going to be a group of elders that fit this secondary category all elders are to rule well all elders are going to have to have the ability to preach and teach but there is a group of elders within every church that are considered those who work hard at preaching and teaching they are to especially paul says to be considered worthy of double honor. Now look at verse 18. Paul just doesn't say this on a whim. He adds some weight to this. For he says, For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. So this group, or even a single elder in a church, that is the gifted one, who is called to ministry, to the ministry of the word, Paul points to the Old Testament law and says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. Now, what is the point of this passage? He's pulling this from Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. We read this and you just think, yeah, that makes sense, right? So Paul here is using this example from the Old Testament to establish that a church ought to pay a pastor because of his work. Now, we hope we understand the heart behind the passage and not the law. Do you get this? Now, here's the heart behind the passage. The law, though, says you must do something. But the law says we want to do something. And the want here, as I think, is more of the emphasis. Now, think of it. If Paul says here, you shall not muzzle the ox, what's the broader context to understand this? Think about it. It would be evil if you owned an ox. And to hook him up and to cause him to work at the threshing floor, and you do not provide him food by not meeting his basic needs. He says, do not muzzle the ox. If the ox is working, think about what the ox is doing. What is the ox doing in this context? He's working hard for you to provide for you food so that you can live everyday life. He's in the threshing floor. That's what the ox is doing. And to care for him or not to care for him is really you doing what? Shooting yourself in the proverbial foot. Because if you don't feed the ox and you muzzle him and you whip him and say, work, do, mill out this grain, what's going to happen to the ox over time? He's going to die. He's going to lay down. He's going to quit if he doesn't die. 
And that's why Paul is saying, if you love yourself, practically what? You'll care for the ox, because he's going to care for you. See, that, that analogy that Paul is pulling from applies spiritually. If you care for your soul, Paul is saying, you will care for your shepherd. So he doesn't have any needs that he has to be distracted away from the needs of the body. Does that make sense? This is what Paul is saying. So when we give, when the church gives, part of what we give goes to do what? To support and care for the needs of the pastor of that local church. So the local church's giving goes to support the pastor so that his needs are always met. So that while he is threshing in ministry for the good of the body, he is not burdened with financial worries. You could look at it this way. The Israelite in Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 4 that did not care for his ox actually hated himself. Because he did not care for the ox and providing for his needs. So in a similar fashion, the church that does not care for the pastor's needs really does not care for itself spiritually. You view your pastor as a hireling. I'm not saying you do that, but I'm just saying with that mentality, that is what you are doing. You know, this week I had the opportunity to sit down with another pastor locally who was having this very issue is the church that he pastors will not pay him. And he's been there for three years and he's been working a full-time job and working about a quarter time at the church and preaching every Sunday. And they have, a bunch, they have several children. And he, says, he told me at lunch, he said, I just can't do this anymore. And he's presented his need. The church is able to meet that need. But the heart behind it is that these men that he's answering to or that are the so-called leaders of this church are thinking more like businessmen and not godly men and he told me he says if his his meeting is going to be soon and he says the final meeting he's going to resign because he can't keep doing it and that's sad it's sad to see how so many churches keep their pastors on you know, an income that's below the poverty rate. I mean, I think the poverty rate in South Carolina is like under like $50,000, right? Or somewhere in there, I'm not sure. But. So you think about how a church needs to love and care for its shepherds, it's by keeping them in a position where they have no needs so that they can focus on shepherding the church. That's why we give. A third reason we give is to support missions yes we want to make sure we're giving to support the needs of those in our body we want to support to so that we can give to support the local pastor but we also want to see that the scripture preach teaches us that we are to we are to give so that we can support missions the local church's giving ought to be to focus on giving to missions now if you look with me to philippians briefly we can see this modeled by the church at, at philippi they were very quick, reticent, available to do what? To give the, uh, to the apostle Paul. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul talks about this. And he says, you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once from for my need. And in verse 18, he says, but I have received everything in full and have, what does it say? An abundance. Wow, he had plenty, right? He had plenty. I am amply supplied, he said, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. This church was passionate about making sure that all of Paul's needs were met so that he could do the work of planting churches and preaching the gospel. That's what the local church ought to be about. The local church ought to be giving a lot of their resources to fund and support missionaries 
like Paul. So that the gospel is going, goes forth. So that churches can be planted. Turn with me to Romans for just a minute. Romans chapter 15, verse 24. The Apostle Paul here talks about his endeavors to want to go to Spain. And Paul talks to the church at Rome and says, Hey, you're going to help meet my needs so I can do that very task. Romans 15, verse 24, he says, Whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing, to be helped on my way there by you. Do you see that? They were going to help Paul. They were going to help Paul get from where he is to Spain. And most theologians don't believe, you know, we all know that Paul didn't make it to Spain, but his, his vision was to go there. And Paul spent his life, think about this, partnering with the churches he planted to help him plant more churches and to help him be a missionary. You see, the natural outgrowth of Paul's ministry was through what? It was through the local church. And this is where Paul established other teammates to go with him. This is where all of his support came from. It came from local churches. So listen, when we give, we give for the purpose here at Grace Bible Church to do that very thing. To give in order to see the mission of the gospel go forth. Some person wrote this. He said, the church exists by missions as fire exists by fuel. Missionary partnerships must be built into the church from the very beginning. For without it, no church will reach its full maturity. Listen, if we exist as to be a lighthouse into the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we need to be a church passionate about giving so that we can see that very thing take place. Not just giving to an organization, right? So that that organization can take our money and give it to where they think is necessary. No, we need to be a church that says, hey, where are some local missionaries that think like we do, believe like we do, and we can see the tangible efforts of our giving in their ministry? That's what we need to think about when we think about local church giving. So this morning, as we think about these things, there's a lot more that can be said. But this morning, just to set the stage, I wanted to just to give us a rubric to run on or think about as it relates to our giving. And as we think about this topic, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and it's going to give us a very clear picture of what God has for us as it relates to this most beloved privilege that we have as a church. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunities that we have as your church to give, to support the, the established uh, church, your church. And I pray, Lord, that you would use the gifts that we give each week for the furtherance of the gospel. And Father, even when we think about needs in our body, think about the, mem the membership here, Lord, our primary responsibility, first and foremost, is to each other as members of this church. And Father, if someone has a need, Father, we just pray that they would let that need be known and we as a church could rise to the occasion to meet a legitimate need. And Father, help us to consider too, Lord, giving to support uh, our pastors here and giving to support missions. Father, we want to be a church that's about those things. And Father, we know we have a, a lot of growing to do in all three of those areas. And Lord, just help us to develop our church around that purpose. And Father, as we dig into this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Father, just help us to see the principles that are going to be laid out so that we can apply them, that we can be obedient, and that we can be the church that you've called us to be. Let me pray this in Jesus' name.